I up until maybe about a year ago, I was a, com a container skeptic. Uh, but through helping researchers struggle, who are struggling with um, doing reproducible research and sharing their work, I've come to realize that there are some real advantages to this particular technology. And I would like to share what I've learned um, and introduce you to the basics of it. So Cybers, I am an employee of Cybers, and we help researchers. It's a great institution. Uh, we help researchers learn about these technologies, uh, productively use them, um, and also uh, and deploy them in production. So the, these technologies like the containers and um, scaling them. So as you might know, modern scientific analysis is getting more and more complex. Um, some of it necessary, you can't escape it, but some of it we can do something about. Things like uh, having to deal with multiple software packages, things like an R dependency, Python, some other uh, library, and, and you have to have specific versions of these, and they have to work together. And then to make things matters worse, you have to also be able to deploy these things to uh, different environments, potentially a collaborator's laptop, um, HPC, and this is where, uh, this is where the, a lot of the pain is coming from. So some of these pains is that you have to install, you have to install these packages one by one uh, and involves a lot of wasted effort and time and it's fragile. Even if, even if you, you think you might get it right, sometimes it's not. And it can lead to hard to reproduce analyses. And this doesn't help our scientific process and it doesn't help, uh, doesn't help you in your career either. So what can we do about it? I'm here to help. Uh, um, and ideally, um, I will help you realize that there are uh, some techniques re related to containers that we can make it easy to install and use these things consistently. Uh, the one way to do this is containers. I don't want to asterisk there. I don't want to give you the idea that this is the only way to do it. Uh, or that it is the best way to do some of these things, but um, they have they have significant advantages. The other interesting thing that's happening is that we're seeing a lot of new packages and applications are increasingly being um, shipped and packaged and made available as containers. Container as a first um, first um, citizen in this world. Things like bio containers. Uh, now, for those people who don't know what a bio container is. Don't worry about it too much. Uh, I'll read something from their website. It says that BioContainers is an open source and community driven framework which provides system agnostic executable environments for bioinformatics software. And crucially, BioContainers framework allows software to be installed and executed under an isolated and controllable environment. So keep that in mind because that is also describes roughly the advantages of, advantages of containers in general. So my uh, Colleague Upendra, who is a real life biologist, uh, helped me uh, some of the biological details of this. And he says that there will be a webinar specifically on biocontainers in the near future. So keep an eye out for that. That should be very interesting. I'm going to lead in with some of the concepts and terms just ahead of the getting into the, into the details so that you, when I start saying words, like images and containers and Docker and Docker files and the various things uh, involved in this world, you'll, you won't get lost completely, hopefully. So I'll, I'll prime you, I'll go through the details, and then uh, we can cover again at the end and go through, well, what did we just see? So, but if you buy any, if you, if you do get lost um, at all during the time, please um, write some questions in the chat. Um, and uh, we will also get some time at the end of this to um, webinar to answer some questions. So, uh, first term I'll introduce is um, image. Uh, now, an image is a self-contained read-only snapshot of your application and all the packages that it requires and all their dependencies in a nested way all the way down so that once you've built this you can then deploy this and share this with other people without them having to uh, go through the process of installing all the dependencies getting it working compiling some 
uh, antiquated, strange package that depends on. Uh, you can save other people a lot of time and yourself when you need to deploy this onto um, onto other infrastructures. So the images is the is one of the core um, um, objects in this container world. And it is the thing that you will end up sharing. We'll get to sharing in a little bit, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, so you may ask me how this relates to things like Conda environments. It's an image can also contain operating system packages. Uh, something like a Python virtual environment or a Conda environment won't necessarily include the right non-Python or non-R dependencies that, that your package or application depends on. So this is a, an extra level of isolation and, uh, for, your, for your package. So that is what an image is. It's a, it's a snapshot. So, so it's the whole world view of the things that you need in order to deploy and in order to run your, um, your analysis. So you may say, well, how do I get to this image? How do I get an image? Um, how do I build an image? So how people build these images is by using something called a Docker file or in the singularity world, I'll get to singularity. It's a recipe, it's, a, it's an executable set of instructions like a bash script uh, that you might run into for creating an image. It also allows you to specify an entry point for the container. We'll get to that when we get to containers. So, um, and I'll show you an example of what a, a Docker file looks like later. And it's, it's not, um, simple ones are not very complicated. It can be as simple as specifying the base for your image, something like a version of Linux, that you want to start from, and then you can specify, okay, I want to start with this operating system package, maybe pull down some source code, compile it, and the uh, Docker or Singularity will go through these steps and execute them, and then you end up with an image. So if this is all a little bit abstract, don't worry, we will uh, make this a little bit more concrete. So then, once you have a, a, uh, an image, you can't, uh, you can't do much with it. It is just a blob of text, uh, sorry, a blob of binary data that sits somewhere either on the internet or on your computer. Uh, and it contains everything that you need to run your container, your pack, your containerized application. But in order to breathe life in it, so to speak, you need to execute it. And then it becomes a container. So uh, I mentioned the entry point before. So a container, every container has a default entry point. So it means that when you run a container, that is going to be the first thing that it runs by default. So for example, if it was say a Jupyter Notebook container, the entry point might be specified as Jupyter Notebook. So that you can just run the container and then Jupyter Notebook will start. And uh, it's, yeah, so a container is think of it as a running image, you grab the image and then you, uh, you, can, uh, you can think of it as like a, an image as a template. And then a container, you can make infinite number of containers from the same template. And then you can share those, get to the sharing. Now, Docker. Uh, Docker is the, uh, it's probably the most popular container runtime. It's not the only one. Um, there is also, uh, there are some others. Uh, Docker is very popular. Uh, and it is almost synonymous with containers in popular uh, popular parlance. Docker contains of a server, sometimes called a daemon. Um, so what, what this means, a daemon or a server, is just a program that runs in the background. It runs, uh, and you can talk to this, uh, this server, and this server uh, handles the life cycle of images and containers. So it use, you can tell the Docker server, please create uh, an image from this um, recipe or um, download this image, um, start a container from this image, um, stop a container. It does all the work on your behalf. And the way you tell it what to do is to use a command line application that you type commands into, this one, one way, where you will say something like docker pull, docker run, and we'll show you some examples later. And the reason they made a separate server in the client is so that you can have a, the server part of it running on a different machine than where you're running 
the actual Docker uh, command. Uh, it's sort of an implementation detail, and Singularity, for example, doesn't do it this way. We'll, we'll get to that. So you can find out more about Docker from uh, here, the main website, docker.com. So I mentioned Singularity, and Singularity is a way to run containers on HPC. The, it is, uh, conceptually seems to me simpler, and when I've taught uh, containers at workshops, it has a simpler uh, model for how it does things, and it works really well in HPC environments where they, they have some certain security concerns that Docker doesn't work well with. But Singularity and Docker are best friends. You can, I recommend that people start with a, building a Docker image of their, of their analysis, and then Singularity has a really nice uh, built-in way to convert Docker images into Singularity images. So they're very, I think they're complementary for researchers anyway. Uh, right, okay, so the Singularity website's there. Um, all of these links, by the way, will be in the slides, and they will be available after the fact. You don't have to take notes right now. So you may ask, well, what about my data? So you package your analysis, your application, your, uh, your code that does whatever it needs to do, but it needs to code without data is useless. Uh, and some of the, I've seen confusion initially, I had this when I initially started using uh, containers, is how do I access the data that my container, containerized application is going to work on? The rule of thumb is, do not put your data in your image. The temptation is to, well, if it's going to run uh, my application, then I, it expects the data to be somewhere in the path, somewhere in the container. I'm just gonna put my data in the image. Don't do that. What you want to do is, uh, is depending on how, and how your data is, um, if it, your data is locally on the machine where you're running the container, you can do, this, um, I have two examples with, will cover both of these, where you can mount your data from your local machine into the container. And for, from the perspective of the application running inside the container, it appears as if it's running in the container. The data is right there. And this is called mounting, sometimes bind mounting. In Docker, it's called a volume. And we'll see, it, we'll see how that works. You can do another thing where you, if your data is remote, like say it's in the Cybers data store or it's an S3, you can, once the container is running, one of the initial steps of your pipeline could be to pull the data from the remote data store, NCBI or something like that, into a place inside the container and then the packages inside the container can operate on those. So those are the two ways. You can mount it, if the data is already on your computer, um, or you can pull it into the container once it's running. You would never actually remember, don't put your data in the image when you build the image, unless it's sanity testing data and it's tiny. Uh, the reason is that somebody may want to pull your image and use their own data, and sometimes these data sets are really large, so you want to try and make these uh, images as small as possible so that they're easy to share and move around. Uh, the other thing that we're going to run into is sometimes your laptop's uh, not enough and you need more resources and maybe more cores, maybe more memory, uh, maybe specialized hardware like GPUs. In case you run into these situations, talk to us. We have a few options and we can point you in the right direction. Some of the national uh, research uh, computing infrastructures, uh, we're I'm happy to point you in the right direction. So how would you share these containers? Uh, the main way that uh, we recommend people share containers is through using image registries. So you would actually share images. People could pull these images and then create containers from these images. So the two big ones are Singularity Hub and Docker Hub. Um, in this, some of the near future webinars, uh, my colleagues will demonstrate how to use these registries. So that was a blurred introduction. I hope that you are um, not too lost. I will go over these again to, um, at the end, and if you have any questions, please um, add them. Okay, so how do we use these containers? I'm going to now uh, 
show you. Um, oh, okay, so I'm, before I jump into this, um, I mentioned that containers are trying to solve these problems. Now, some of these problems are reproducible research and dependency management. And so the demos I'm going to show you are relatively simple, but when you extrapolate these into larger uh, pipelines that can have very many dependencies, you run into situations where the advantages of containers uh, outweigh the maybe initial learning curve of using them. So if these uh, demos seem somewhat simple um, and trivial, um, keep that in mind that I didn't want to introduce too much too quickly. Uh, and uh, yeah, some of the future webinars will get into sort of more scientifically relevant uh, examples. So the first one I'm going to show you is a command line application. And it is an example of using biocontainers that I mentioned before. I'm going to just change my screen sharing uh, setting here to show my terminal. Please bear with me while I navigate Zoom. All right. I think that should be it. Okay. And I'll move that up there so I can see my notes. Uh, can somebody just tell me in the chat whether uh, they can see my Screen. Yes, we can see your command line. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. So, I am in the directory that I made here. I am going to run, uh, I'm going to run a, an application called Blast. And I'm just going to find the, uh, there we go. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you this. Uh, it contains this directory contains a single file. It's called a Docker file, and uh, it is uh, I mentioned before. It is the instructions for building an image. I'll show you what the contents of this looks like. So if we do this. Uh, See, the, the folks are very nice. I copied this from the biocontainers examples. And so what this means, this line here with from biocontainers, it says that this image that I'm going to build is going to be built from this biocontainers image as a base. I'm going to not reinvent the wheel, so to speak, for what is in the biocontainers. I'm going to use the biocontainers base image and then add my own things on top of it. This is a great way of leveraging the good work of other people in the uh, bioinformatics community. So this is all some metadata and labels and really the most important lines are for this particular one is at the end here where you can see that we run conda install blast and we also set a working directory of forward slash data forward slash. Keep that in mind and that'll become relevant soon. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the docker build command. The docker build takes a docker file recipe and creates an image. So I start, you always specify a tag. I'm going to give it a name, my name. This is going to be the name of my image and dot, which means if you're familiar with Unix, it means the current directory. So it's going to look in the current directory. Now I built this just before, so all of these things are cached. That's why it was so fast, but it takes about five minutes if you do this from scratch. And then if I run Docker images, you'll see that there is this JPEG stories blast. I built it two hours ago and you can see how big it is. Now we're going to just run the Docker Run command, oh, clear, and clear. All right, docker run jpistorius forward slash blast latest. And then blast p dash 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 help. Just to prove us that what this command does here is it says, with this image, JPEG story slash blast, create a container. So it's gonna take an image and create a container from it. 
and then run this command after the image, blast p dash help. So it's going to start a container from this image and then run the blast p command with the dash help parameter. And if you uh, are familiar with Unix tools, um, this will uh, uh, this will seem familiar. Uh, so if I'm going to run that and I'll pipe it through less, you'll see that. Um, now, this is the Blast P application. This Blast P is not installed on my own computer. It's, and it's packaged in this container. It's like a single file, and it contains Blast and all its dependencies. So I've proven that it exists. It, it lives in this container. Now I'm going to do grab some data. Oh, so uh, at this point, uh, I'm assuming that most people on this call are biologists. Uh, so I am not going to explain too much about what Blast is. I'm going to just my colleague Upendra, who is a real life biologist, told me that what Blast does is um, it is a pulling a protein. Um, sorry, Blast is a tool for comparing um, DNA sequences. Um, it can be nucleotides or amino acids, um, and the idea is to see how much similar or dissimilar the sequences are. Um, okay, I think that's enough. Uh, we will get more into the scientific details of some of the other tools in future um, webinars. So the details of the exact um, application hopefully shouldn't matter too much. But next step I'm going to do is grab the grab a file which is a protein FASTA file using the wget command. So now if I do ls-al, you'll see that beside the Docker file, there's also a FASTA file. I'm going to then get a uh, file from NCBI, which is the zebrafish protein sequence. Uh, so there you can see it there. Uh, and I'm going to unzip this file so now we have there it is and here comes the next docker command which i'm just going to copy oh uh, i didn't mean to execute that but i will go over what's happening here so this docker command is very important here you know how i mentioned before about the local data in this case the, our local data is this blast we want to operate on this uh, zebrafish uh, protein file. Uh, and in order to make this data file show up inside the running container so Blast can see it, we have to what we call bind mount. And this is what this dash dash volume parameter does. And what it does is it says, take this uh, directory here, forward slash users julian p dev tem forward slash blast, colon, forward slash data. If you remember what I um, showed you, the Docker file from before, I will just show you again. At the end of it, it said that the working directory is forward slash data. That means that when it runs an application, it starts as if you are in the forward slash data directory inside the container. But by default, there's nothing there if we don't add this forward slash, uh, this dash dash volume. So, uh, there's a bit of Docker magic involved, um, and we can talk about that more towards the end if you want, um, so that when the container runs, this directory, this uh, that temp directory where all my files are, shows up as forward slash data inside the container. This is how you can ship containers around without having to build your data into the images. Right, okay, so, um, and again, so the, the rest of this should look familiar. We're running the um, creator blast DB, um, the in file, um, so we're creating the protein and the uh, database type is protein. So the output of this now, you'll see that there are some new files here. And that was as a result of making this database. And then we are going to create some more things. Whoops. Okay. So we're going to run another command where we're going to use this database. Again, we map a bind mount, this temporary directory uh, with our data in it, into the container. 
This time we're going to run a different command from inside the container. This is an ex a good example of how you can have multiple, you can have your whole pipeline with different packages all packaged in the same container. You can see how we're using different commands here. Uh, so, okay, we're going to now run something where it does a query um, and it creates some output. I think it tries to find sequences in common. I'm going to run this again. should be relatively quick. And now if we see, you'll see that there's a results.txt. So the, uh, for people who know what these things mean, there we go. There's some sequences. Align sequences. Biologists will know what I'm talking about. Okay, so that was a command line application. Uh, it's if you run this uh, container, if you ship this container to anybody else, they'll be able to do exactly this. They wouldn't have to install Blast. You could just share this. So this is obviously a very simple example. Uh, but imagine if you had, I don't know dozens of packages, dozens of applications for different parts of a relatively complicated pipeline. This becomes a real benefit. Okay, so I'm going to go to the next example, which is a web application. So I'm going to have to explain a little bit what I mean by that. Uh, this is something that I cloned off um, GitHub. So I cloned somebody's GitHub repository, and this is going to run something very similar to what we just did, but using a Jupyter Notebook. So web application, um, unlike a terminal uh, or a command line application like we just had, is an application where the user interface is accessed through a web browser. Uh, think of something like, uh, you know, uh, GitHub, GitHub is a web application. A Jupyter Notebook is a web application. A R Studio server is a web application. You may, might have used Slack online. That is, the, that is what I mean by a web application. Uh, and uh, for doing visual analyses and uh, graphing and things like that, they're very handy. So I'm going to now just do, I'm going to build an image from this particular one. Okay, all right. So remember the docker build command? So it's gonna be a slightly different uh, name. The name of this image is going to be jpistorius forward slash blast n dash jupyter dash docker. And it's going to look at this docker file there and it's going to build, um, build the image from that. Let me just show you what the content of that docker file looks like before. I... So it's a little bit more complicated than the previous one. But again, you see this from line here on, uh, it says from Ubuntu Bionic 2018, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so what this means is instead of starting from a bio container base, like we did with the previous example, this starts with an even more fundamental uh, example, um, a container, sorry, a fundamental uh, image, lower level. So Ubuntu is a variety of Linux and uh, you can start from really stripped down versions of various operating system images that are available online. Uh, in this case, uh, so here is an example of the power of containers over something like Conda or a Python virtual environment. Because you can also do things like install uh, specific versions of uh, operating system packages. Now this is, um, so in this case, we do the apt-get uh, apt update and apt-get install of wget, bzip2, ca certificates, and a bunch of other things. Uh, you can see how this could be really useful in the case of we have to deploy some, something like this on an environment where you don't have the privileges to install operating system packages. And if the modules available on an HPC system is not available, then you, you're, at the, you're at the mercy of your local HPC admin. This, by using containers, you get around this uh, limitation. So it does a bunch of things. It actually downloads some packages. And it does a few other things. All right, so we're gonna build this container. Image, I mean. And then we're going to run this. We're going to start it. Okay, so we are, uh, 
we built the image and we started the container. And what it actually did, it had started a, um, started a, uh, I'm gonna have to reshare, it started a, a, a web server, but it's actually running a Jupyter notebook um, on this URL here. Uh, and I'm going to share a different view. Where is my file new private window? Excuse me, I'm going, where is my screen sharing? You share. Oh, here we go. Whoop. Okay. Bear with me. Okay, here we go. This might look familiar to you if you know a little bit about Jupyter Notebook. Uh, we are in here, so we can see that we have Jupyter Notebook. Uh, we can, and, and oh, this is an example, by the way, of, I mean, you know, I mentioned at the beginning about how to get your data to operate on. In this case, we're not binding local data into the container, we're pulling data down. So uh, the first step in this is that it actually pulls down some data using the curl command uh, from an S3 bucket, the last tutorial data. Then, so you can see how it creates the data there. Then we're going to call inside this Jupyter cell make blast DB with the data that we just downloaded. Runs there, so now it's there. It should have a uh, new DB title there. Check to make sure that the file was created. And it runs this section, and now you can see that it has, it has the output. It wasn't there in the beginning. So this is an example of how you can run these web applications inside um, containers as well. I'll switch my screen sharing back to my new share to okay. So that was a very. Uh, can somebody tell me if they're seeing which of my screens they're seeing? Am I are you seeing this demo? The demo web app. Right. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, we're almost done. So uh, Cyverse is, uh, has support for containers in a number of different ways. You can use the from the command line like I just did on uh, Atmosphere, which is a virtual machines as a service. Uh, you can check it out on our catalog. You can also use Vice or the virtual interactive compute environment. There are some webinars available online that you can find. Uh, it's very popular for interactive computing like visualization and analyses. Um, also, we, you can use Cybers resources to orchestrate and deploy containers on large computing environments available through national compute infrastructures like the Open Science Grid. So uh, the benefits, just to summarize, packaging your analysis pipeline in a single container to avoid the pain of dependency management, the it works on my machine syndrome. This, so everybody in your lab and all your collaborators can have consistent environments. And the next time we will go more into how to build containers and how to run them on different platforms and as well as scientifically relevant applications of containers. So my colleague Tyson Swetnam will go into some of this. Some links and references. Um, so where you can find out more um, and also how to get started with containers. I would just like to thank these folks who helped me in preparation and of course the NSF. So I think that's it for today. If you have any questions, we're going to pause the recording and then answer some questions at the end. Thanks, Julian. Um, I don't, I'm looking at the chat and I do not see any questions. So if people have questions, you're welcome to unmute yourself um, and ask away. Otherwise, um, I thought it was pretty clear. It was really helpful that you gave all the introductory, and, uh, introductory information and about the terms and things. Um, clearly, there's a lot more to learn and that Tyson will follow up uh, this webinar with the actual building of a Docker and a Singularity uh, container. Yep. So, are there any questions? Oh, let's see. Oh, we do have one. Yes, that's yeah. a really good question um, from Liana. 
Uh, the question is, are the containers similar to VirtualBox? And uh, in general, VirtualBox is an example of something called uh, a virtual machine. Uh, I have some notes about that because that is a common question and a question that I had when I initially started using containers as well, because I was using VirtualBox for a lot of my development. And the, uh, the, the, re the answer is containers are similar to virtual machines in certain specific ways and different in other ways. You can use containers in circumstances where you can't use VirtualBox. Uh, example here would be if you need to run a container on um, remote infrastructure like Open Science Grid or your local HPC cluster, they won't be able to run VirtualBox on your behalf, but they almost certainly have Singularity installed. Uh, so Singularity and the other the other reason why the other way that virtual machines and doc, and containers are different is that virtual machines actually virtualize hardware. It simulates uh, it simulates an entire machine in software. Whereas with uh, containers, they simulate, they virtualize an operating system. It hides away the abstractions of the operating system and presents a very simplified view of the underlying operating system as opposed to the underlying hardware. What this means in practice is that containers start much faster than virtual machines do, and they also use less resources. You can run many, many more containers on the same hardware than you can virtual machines. Okay, so another question here, could you go over mounting or binding data? How can I retrieve or read write my data if it is on remote infrastructure? So those are actually yeah, two, two separate questions. So I mentioned that there was two ways of accessing your data. Uh, the first one was uh, local data where you mount it into a container. Uh, and the second one is how to pull data into the container once it's running. And I explained both, I showed demos of those, but I went over it relatively quickly. So I'm going to quickly share my screen again, and then I'll show you the difference. I did go over that very quickly. Share my terminal here. Uh, okay, let me see. Put that, okay. So if we go, we'll do the first. I'll show you how the uh, I'll show you how the, uh, the binding of the local data works. Uh, Docker run. We did this. I'm just going to change this slightly, and then change this last p. I'm going to make it bash. Hmm, maybe I can't do it with this one, hang on. Okay, I'm going to map this into here. And run this again. Okay, so I've run the Jupyter uh, Notebook container from before. But this time I'm using the, the bind or the volume mount where um, I have this blast directory and I'm mounting it to the data directory inside the container. So let's find that, uh, let's find that Jupyter notebook that I had. I need to share, where is that? Firefox browser. Window. Uh, okay. HTTPA. Uh, local host. Share. I'm just going to share this. 
Oh, here we go. Okay. Okay, so here is the uh, here is this uh, uh, Jupyter notebook again. I'm going to create a terminal, which is like a setting, opening up a session inside the container. And then if we go to cd forward slash data, and if I do ls dash al, you'll see these files. These are the same files that I had in the uh, uh, forward slash users, Julian P forward slash the dev forward slash temp. And that's what the bind does. So if I have data on my local computer, I want it to show up inside the container, then I use that dash dash volume, which is the bind. So, and uh, let's see. But in the same one, this Jupyter notebook doesn't assume that there is data. It uses the second, uh, uh, the second method of getting data, which is once the container is up and running, there's no local data for it to use. Uh, you want to then use something to pull down the data from some data store, NCBI or the Cybers data store or wherever it is, Dropbox. There are a number of different places where you can store it. What it does then in this, the first step of your pipeline, in this case, it's just a cell in the Jupyter notebook. We see if there is not what this line here in this bash line uh, cell does is so if the file blast tutorial doesn't exist, get it. So for example, I'll go over here and uh, CD work. I'm going to see how there is no file here. There's only the blast tutorial. And if I now execute this cell, I go back here. Oh, I don't know if you can, hopefully you can see that. Uh, and I do an lh a on now, you'll see that there is a new file here, blasttutorial.tar.gz. And that is what this step did here. It pulled it down from the internet. So that's one way you can do it, where you don't even have to have the data locally. This is really good for when you're distributing data, uh, your containers around to um, Open Science Grid, and you need to get the, you, you just want to ship a container as small as, as an image, small enough image to ship around easily and then just pull the data in afterwards. So you don't have to have the data locally on the compute node in this case. You're, and you can do this in the container. Uh, we have a couple more questions. Yes, I'm going to see. And then we had here, are there best practices on deciding the granular, granularity with which to containerize your workflow? For example, having a container for each step in a complex workflow or having it all in one container where dependencies might conflict. If I package my workflow pieces into different containers, could I nest them into a bigger containers? Do Docker and Singularity work well with containers inside containers? Uh, yeah, well, so as I said, uh, containers solve many problems and this is, uh, there are a number of different ways of solving this particular one. You wouldn't necessarily nest containers inside containers. In this particular case, it's probably simpler. I would, I advise generally more simpler entities in my code, in, um, in how I structure things. Uh, if you have a, if you have a choice, I would go for, this is just my personal preference, having, many simple containers that you can combine, uh, you, can, you can push them all, maybe like stage one, stage two, stage three, and then you would pass your data from one running container to another. Uh, these containers are very small and they're very efficient the way that, they, uh, the way that they're uh, stored. So even if you use a little bit more storage, Keeping your dependencies and your installation steps as simple as possible, I think, has the biggest uh, has the biggest value. Now, Singularity has an interesting. So that's uh, that's sorry. I should probably make that that applies to both Singularity and Docker, um, mostly for Docker. Singularity has an interesting advantage in that it can has something called the scientific file system, and I've played with it a little bit. And it's a way to actually have separate environments and separate entry points for different stages of your pipeline inside the same container. And it does a, a better job of isolating those, um, those different parts of your pipeline. Uh, and it's built for this particular, that feature is built for this particular use case. Uh, and the, uh, 
Docker came from the world of web applications running in on internet applications for you know Facebook and things like that. It's not. It didn't start as in the scientific research world like Singularity did. So it does things optimized for a slightly different use case. Um, so that's why I think Singularity has an edge over Docker in this particular story. So, um, sorry, just to summarize that, don't have containers inside containers. Try to avoid nesting as much as possible. Keep, uh, keep your as few layers as possible and keep them simple and standalone as much as possible. I hope that made sense, Travis. Okay. Uh, now, Peter asks, how do I create a container that has operating system specific requirements? Example on Windows, it requires the installation of an extra Windows executable. That's interesting. Okay, that's, uh, that's actually an interesting question. Uh, most of the time, this is the, this is the cool thing about containers. It avoids having to even do this. Uh, in practice, 99.9% .9 of the containers that you will run into are what we call Linux containers, which means that when you run the container, it is as if it's running in Linux, even if you're running it on Windows. I ran these uh, containers on my Mac operating system. But when I run the container, it's running inside Linux. Um, when you run this on Windows, it's also running it inside Linux. And on Mac and Windows, you can't run containers natively on the operating system. You have to have a, a Linux virtual machine that's first, and then it runs the container inside the virtual machine. Uh, the operating system, there are, there are native containers for these operating systems, but they're not generally not used uh, in the same way that we use uh, Docker and Singularity. So that's why, fortunately, this problem doesn't come up. Uh, you, um, more generally though, if, I'll, 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 I'm going to twist your question for my own benefit here, which is that there are circumstances where you want to have specific um, differences depending on maybe you want to run something on a GPU cluster and you need to have certain maybe NVIDIA graphics cards drivers and things like that. So maybe you want to have a version of your pipeline that can run without GPU drivers and one that can run with GPU drivers. And Docker and Singularity both have ways to create multiple images from the same files. You have separate files and create separate contain, um, images, or you can have a, a parameterized recipe that can then build multiple images from the same um, recipes. I haven't done that, um, but I know it's possible. So it's, uh, uh, yeah, maybe Tyson can, uh, Tyson can show a little bit about that in the next one. So let's see. Travis also asks, any tools on uh, managing the execution of many containers as steps in a workflow if one goes the granular route? I suppose a bash script could do this. Hmm. Yes, you're right. Uh, bash script is one way to do that. Uh, there are, uh, I'm trying to think, there are also some of the, the newer, and even some of the newer workflow systems like Makeflow and uh, Nextflow, and I, I think Upendra can probably pipe in here. He's a, uh, yep, Upendra mentioned Nextflow. Upendra is a, a, our bioinformatician, and there's a lot of uh, experience using exactly this kind of situation where you have uh, one part of your pipeline could use a container, take some raw data in, produce some output data, and then the next container can run, take the input of the previous, sorry, output of the previous step as input, et cetera, et cetera, and chain it like that. Uh, so yeah, so there, is a, there are definitely tools out there to do this, uh, Nextflow um, being one of them. The Cybers discovery environment uh, has a has a way of doing this. You can package different different applications as as containers, and then you can build up a pipeline that can use containers and put them together like uh, Lego blocks, and build up a pipeline like this. 
this is this is still in a, uh, a rapidly evolving, very exciting um, world. Uh, we um, we're definitely in, a, in an era of you know certainly have solved a lot of these lower level problems, and we can operate at higher levels of abstraction thanks to things like containers and orchestration frameworks. Uh, Tina mentioned that we will have a focus forum webinar on Nextflow later this spring. So thanks, Tina. So are there any more questions for Julian at this time? Thank you. Those are great questions and um, very enlightening. Um, if there are no further questions, thank you everybody, everyone for attending today. Um, be sure to go on our website and register for the next series of uh, webinars. And uh, the one on February 8th, again, is by Tyson, and it's entitled Going Places with, with Your Containers. And it will build on this foundation that Julian has provided today. So have a great weekend. Again, I'll be following up with the wiki page that all these materials will be found on, the chat, the slides, as well as the YouTube video from today. And then we'll hope to see you in a couple weeks. Thank you, everyone.